I wish I was in Pomaguan. I can assure you he's slightly taller than I am, and incredibly more handsome, and definitely more knowledgeable, and much more articulate than I am. But let me try. May do so me in her indomitable spirit spoke to Ntates Tole and I uh, last night to say could we get our part here this morning because it's manifestly in our best interest if we don't want to get into trouble. I had a seven o'clock breakfast with my boss, Mark Gainsborough, who flew in last night from Livingston. Uh, he lives in Singapore. He's our executive vice president for a global commercial business. I work for a small company called Shell Oil Products Africa. I'm their group CEO in China. And she asked me to come and talk to you this morning about leadership, a subject that I know very little about. But I've prepared 12 slides. The plan was to talk to only four of those 12 slides. Um, and then only afterwards, you'll get all 12 that she will give to you so that you can use it as pet country. Do I have your permission to start? My definition of leadership is anybody that feels called upon to lead is a leader. Therefore, by that definition, a bus driver, a domestic helper, a manager, a supervisor, even some of our people that do the tutorial of services, all they have to do is to feel called upon to lead. Therefore, they are leaders. So you can see that leadership has very little to do with our titles, our positional power, but more to do with a state of mind, a headspace. It's an approach to the department. It's the way you talk, walk, and you hold yourself in front of other people. That's what leading is all about. And I compare and contrast that with this hackneyed phrase that we refer to as management. Management is defined as getting things done through other people. In its most basic of sense, it's about the effectiveness and efficiencies in climbing the corporate ladder of success. Whilst leadership, on the other hand, begs the question as to whether the ladder is leaning against the correct wall to start off with. So in my book, leadership is about being genuinely obsessed with the development of others. It is very much like lovemaking. It is not about being self-centered. It is about being other centric. You are concerned about the well-being of the other human being, not of your own. Because once you have achieved uh, the highest echelons uh, in corporates or in your own space, you get to a space where you have calm and tranquility, where you have absolute joy with your lot in life. You are not concerned about yourself anymore. Because once you are called chairman of Shell, I mean, how high can you go? What more do you want? Once you are called the group CEO of Shell Oil Products Africa with a presence in 34 of the now 54 African countries, and we employ 20,000 people. Last year, we posted 586 million US dollar profit. What more do you want? So it's about not suffering from the Peter principle, where some of your colleagues come to you to present some brilliant ideas. And as soon as they leave, you go to your boss and you say, look how clever I am. Look what I've thought out. It's about wanting to catch your people doing the right thing. Then you highlight, highlight and celebrate that. So let me give you a framework of how I think about leadership because these days it's nice to have some sort of a formula. And I'll give it to you just in three buckets. We put leadership center stage in everything that we do. Whether you're in government, you run your own BE entity, or a consultant, or you are a hired gun like myself. I've been truly blessed with running not one, but five uh, of the most uh, significant uh, companies. In 1996, when it was not fashionable uh, for South Africans to run South African companies, I was already managing director of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company, Otis Elevators. 
They were located not far from here. It's called Triple Two Marshall Street. We had a factory at Bayfield. We had a presence in 222 countries and locations, and we hired 189,000 people. And since then, up until now, I find the way I think and approach this important subject called leadership has never really disappointed. So leadership, the first bucket for me, it's around context. Because every leader is a product of your context. The boss that hired me, his name is Erun van der Fier. From the name you can tell, he's typically Dutch. When he came on as a CEO, we were suffering from the reserve crisis. Shell got their reserves wrong. The analysts and the investors stopped believing in us. They created an 80 billion US dollar gap between ourselves and the biggest international oil company, Exxon, after the merger of Mobil, called Exxon Mobil. And they just didn't believe that we could execute on the promises that uh, we had made. And all Yerun understood was that it doesn't matter what an incredible team I could amass and put around me, the market just wanted to know that at some stage we will get our maths correct and we'll be able to give a number that is credible, that is believable. And for the next five years, that's what it did. Our share price was the fourth of the five biggest international oil companies. By the time we left after five years, we were number two, which shows it made progress. Peter Vuzza took over from him. His pain was to try and reduce um, the cost. At that time, we had become a little bit lazy and fat, like most governments influence in the world, even though we were masquerading uh, as a private entity. Maybe the biggest and easiest example uh, to wrap our minds around this is what Holisha Nelson Mandela understood his brief to be when he took over as the first CEO of South Africa Incorporated uh, on the 17th of April, uh, 1994. Some of you were probably not born at that time. But he really expressly understood that uh, here were two people that came from two different worlds. There was this white world and this black world, and the two uh, didn't know very much about each other. And he really gave us this magnificent gift of a united, inclusive, non-racial, constitutional democracy. The biggest gift he gave us was reconciliation. Today, as a people with great natural endowments, stand under the same flag as one nation. And we see the same national anthem that were written by two people who had very different political orientations. So imagine if all he did was to amass a team of 400 MPs and he immediately focused on service delivery. It wasn't going to, to work. And today, we even intermarry. Remember there were 170 pieces of legislation that ensured that the two of us uh, never shall meet. Uh, apart from Group Areas Act, some of you, and I've got my friends from uh, Botswana here, they, they can't co conceive of the fact that a government would say, if you are black, you can only live here. If you are white, you can only live here. And if you cross the boundary over the weekend at the middle of the night, on Monday morning in Sinawana, it's a way to get a call uh, from the services branch to say you have overstayed your work. They monitored and controlled that with the singularity of them. No, they did much more than that. They went into our bedrooms. Between our sheets, they had the Immorality Act, which prevented you from kissing somebody from a different nationality. Can you believe a government concerning itself with a candidate? So that's why that context is so important. If I have a bit of time, I'll come back to that context. I will not unpack it, maybe just throw two or three things to demonstrate the context in which we, as South African managers, find ourselves in and that we are trying to manage. The second piece is around direction setting. Leaders lead. Workers work. If you understand that simple notion, you then really begin to comprehend that events like Malikana were less of an inflection point, turning point, or even a tipping point, than they were a very crucial conversation that 
the miners and the community uh, in that small town were having with greater South Africa. A conversation that simply says we could not have benefited from 150 years of mining. Successful mining. This mining that has created this town called Johannesburg. This province that we call, we call Gauteng uh, from exactly the mineral uh, that propelled uh, this economy forwards and upwards into that type of tragedy. To simply say it cannot be that you continue to make profits until they come out of your ears, but you are less concerned about the well-being of the community from which uh, these mines are located. And since then, I think this is going to define how we engage in direct and interface with our workers and indeed communities. So that in the ultimate end, the vision is to have not only a successful, viable, profitable entity, but also companies that have a positive predisposition by those communities in which they operate. Because it was Henry Ford who said, a company that only makes profit is a poor business indeed. William E. Merck founded this wonderful company called Merck Shapendo, called MSD for short, in the US of A. Today, when we walk into the annals um, uh, of, of MSD, uh, and you see them proudly display um, this philosophy. And he simply said, we try and remember that medicine is for the people, not for the money. The more we have remembered that, the more money we have made. My grandmother that brought up used to teach us that if you wake up in the morning and your only preoccupation is how you can make money, you are unlikely to make it. But if you follow your passion and you do those things that you want to do, even though you do not get recognized, you are likely to be extremely well. This same grandmother who said to me, being rich is having money. Being wealthy is having time. So when you approach 40 like I do, you start being very <laughs> deliberate, purposeful and conscious about the type of things you want to do. So when you reach 40, you only want to be with the people that you want to be. You only do the things that you want to do. You stop smiling at people when they tell lousy jokes just because you want to fit in. You only laugh if it titillates you and touches you in a very beautiful way. That's the beauty of reaching this mature age of 40, like some of us are now approaching. So it's about direction setting. So it's about waking up in the morning and saying, we are going to turn left one degree. That's direction setting. So imagine when the rock driller comes up from the belly of the earth, comes up to loan me management and says, I think I've got a better idea as to how you can run this entity. And I'm going to determine the strategic thrust of this organization. There will be chaos. That's not their job. Their job is to blast the living daylight out of that rock. The best way they know how. Leave the strategic thinking to management, who are normally on the surface in air-conditioned offices. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what they meant. Because this grandmother that, taught, that brought me up said, hard work is good. Hard work is the only thing that gives us things of value. To put it another way, there is nothing of value that can be achieved without blood, sweat, and tears. Today, when people are, are absolutely broke on Wednesday, on Friday, they rock up in the full in Soweto, driving an X5 m that's red with a white interior. And nobody asks the question, how the hell did you achieve that? Today, work is defined by some of my colleagues. You are, what do you do? I am Shama 10. Since work is 10, that's work. <laughs> the only way you build an economy, like the one that you want to build, is by producing goods and services. That's the world wants. And if you give the world what it wants, you can name your price. So this grandmother used to say to me, intense work, is rest. So if I approach work with the spirit of a young child, when young children wake up out of bed in the morning, they don't even think about making up their bed. They are out of that door like a grease lightning and they are running, they are playing, they are up there, they even forget to eat. You have to call them in to say, come and eat because you will stop growing. And the more they play, the more energy they get. So imagine if we worked that way. The more we work, the more energy we get. 
you will stop seeing people at two o'clock saying I've had enough day, it's been a long day, I'm really exhausted. Because if you do, generally do what you're passionate about, it energizes you. It does not deplete your energy. The last piece is this thing that we call organizational capability. Because you see, we work in organizations. Um, and in the, the, the requisite 21st century skills that are needed today are that of team players rather than individual superstars. Because what we need in the 21st century are the skills that come very natural to women than they do to men. That ability to have high emotional coaching, to be able to read between the lines, to be able to look somebody when they walk through the door, like Tandim Dumalo, my real boss, in the office, sees me and says, before she says, good morning, she says, boss, it looks like you didn't have a good night. But if you are a man, you meet another man in the run and says, how are you, boss? I'm suffering from scams and how are you? No, 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 it's great. <laughs> because we are such bad listeners. The biggest skill today needed of leadership is to understand your strategy, to be able to articulate it, to increase the employee engagement so that they have a sense of belonging and ownership. When they do that well, you will know that you have succeeded when you hear them in the run and say, we have decided to turn left one degree. Not the new boss has decided to turn left one degree. Because then you have succeeded in co-crafting and co-creating this new mission, this new vision. When they see their words, their expressions in your vision statements, <coughs> your mission statement, hung often uh, in the uh, reception halls uh, of your very eloquent and opulent head offices. So this organizational capability has to accept the fact that what we are really seized with is to create an ecosystem that defines how we interact, engage, and interface with each other and one another in that environment. Because today technology exists where people can eavesdrop into your systems and be able to determine the price you are going to give at 2 o'clock this afternoon on that RFP you are responding to. They can get access to that. Because today, we know that the company can be the bricks and mortar. Because most companies that are inappropriately located can easily move their headquarters. The whole Western Cape economy was driven by financial services and by retail. One of those financial services companies, the biggest of them all, is Old Mutual. The head office used to be in Pinelands, while Salam used to be in in Belleville, number two strand road. Today, Old Mutual is here in Central, and they continue to make money. Shell's head office, we've been in this country for seven years. For the last eight years, we've moved it from Cape Town. We are at the Dimension Data Campus in Princeton. And the business continues to run. Nothing has changed. Oh, obviously, it can't be products and services because companies change their products and services. This company called Sony, huge electronics giant, started by selling products. The product changed and they're still continuing. So, the real company, we, we really not <laughs> exaggerating when we say the biggest asset we have in companies are people. So, when I grew up, I used to go to my boss and say, you know, boss, I've just gotten married to this wonderful woman. Her name is Susan, by the way, 24th of August. <laughs> we'll be happily married for 33 years. Wow. Yo, she's very patient. <laughs> to stay with the original husband for 33 years. I would have traded him the bloody husband for a long time. Especially the one with such a rotten attitude. But today, when we say people are our most genuine asset, then I go to my boss and say, just got married to Susan, and she looks like she's eating enough. Uh, we'll need 23 more rent in my monthly salary. Could you make a plan? My boss used to jump up, go to the window, pull the curtain, and say, you see those people outside? I said, yes, boss. He said, they are very happy to do what you are doing at half the price. And I'll go straight to my corner. OK, forget that I mentioned. I'll work harder. I'll depend on a bonus maybe at the end of it. Today, it's very different. When I talk to our new recruits, and I do that once a quarter in a full week of orientation. 
I look them in the eye and I say, I thank you for choosing to work for Shell. Because you had many options. You could be anywhere. You could have chosen to work for Google, Microsoft, or even AppSA. And you chose us. You chose us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. These assets go home every afternoon. And I pray to God that they come back the next morning. And when they do, they see me rubbing my hands in glee and say, thank God for answering my prayers. Because it takes you, on average, about nine months to replace a really skilled employee. To replace. You find them, most of them who are really good, have a three months uh, notice period. And they come in, it takes them another nine months to figure out how things are done here before they're effective and efficient. So it's actually cheaper to stay with the employees that you know. So that English expression that says, better the devil you know, it is absolutely a truth. <coughs> so this third bucket around organizational capabilities, for me, rests on four legs. How much? <laughs> so the first one has to be people. We always start first with the who, then the what. Because when you get the right people in the first place, you are most likely to get people who will help you even figure out the one. The second piece is around structure. So Management 101 teaches us that structure follows strategy. But structure for me, if you define strategy as how to win, and governance as the separation between ownership and control, you have to describe structure as how we tessel it like a jigsaw puzzle, how we are organized how we are going to relate. Who's going to be chief, who's going to be Indian, and who's going to be a rock driller, who's going to stay in the air-conditioned offices. If we don't do that, there will be chaos. That's why the armies are so effective and efficient. Because in the army, your job is not to argue about the chosen strategy. Your job is to execute. And most governments, including our own, if they figure out only that fact, that South Africa will not rise or fall on the quantum of our resources, but on our manage, on our ability to manage. Just to play and lead, coordinate and all. If we did that very well, I think we have more than enough resources to wipe out uh, the three things that keep us away at night. Stubbornly high levels of unemployment that are continues to rise, which then lead to increasing levels of poverty and increasing levels of inequality. The third piece, or, of course, is around systems and processes. These things that allow us to do stuff in companies to have organizational memory, sometimes we refer to as institutional memory. You are born on, you manage your share as the chairman of the group CEO on your sixth year, and then you get a letter one day to say, could you give us a reference on Mary Shongo, who used to work for you in 1928? <laughs> of course you don't remember, but you go to system and say, aha, she used to be our organizational development manager from that time to that time, and she left us in then systems and processes allow it to do that. The last piece is this thing called culture. Let me submit to you that there is nothing more important that we are seized with as leaders than to create a culture that is enabling. More than anything else that we do in our job as leaders. And that culture can only be set from the top. There's a wonderful book by Bob Garrett, The Fish Rocks from the Head on corporate governance. Most things can be built from bottom up, but the culture is really set from the top, that tool. So if you set a type of tool that says, it's okay when your own kids approach you to say, Dad, I don't have a pencil, I don't have photocopy, people say, don't worry, my child, I'll get it from when. <laughs> know that you are creating a culture and you are giving your employees permission to take the head court one week at a time. Because one day you wake up and the whole head court will be moved. Because that's the culture that we create. So in transformation terms, when we talk about culture, we say, you know the farmer does not spend most of their time massaging individual seeds. That's not their job. They spend more than 80% of their time tilling the soil, preparing the environment. Biblically speaking, that parable of the four seeds, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with any of those four seeds. One fell in the road, got eaten by the bears. The other one amongst rocks, couldn't develop roots. Therefore, could thrive, but there was this lucky seed that fed in fertile soil 
grew and bore fruit in abundance. That's our job. There is no wrong seed. When the soil is fertile, every single solid tract of our employees can grow roots, bear fruit, and grow in abundance. I said I'll go back to that context one. But we are also managing South Africa and the small companies that we manage at a time where the world is converging and inter disintegrating at the same time. At the time that there are six forces that are driving business today. Because I don't have five more minutes, let me just talk, tell you about the five mega trends that underpin this environment in which you operate. So the first, and I will not unpack it so that I respect your time, is this notion of finite earth. We only have one earth. Unlike kidneys, you know, we've got two of everything. If you mess up this earth, you can't say, but I'll go and live in the moon. At least not today. So it behooves us to recognize that we have not really inherited so much from our forebears as we borrowed it from our children. So we have to live it in a space that is substantially better than before. The second one is this whole notion of changing demographics. So Europe and US of A, they are experiencing negative population growth. In Africa, positive population growth. So one in two people in the world live in China, India, and Africa. There's almost a billion of us. Everywhere else in the world, there are more young people than people like us, mature people. In South Africa, there's 51.7 million of us. 57% of this population is people that are 35 years or younger. If you understand that, you really comprehend why the Arab Spring happened. And if you understand that, you'd be worried that until and unless we do something about youth unemployment, that you and I are in trouble. Because when your neighbor is hungry, you can sleep at night. So unemployment officially, and you know, officially is always underestimated. It's 25.7%. Youth unemployment is more than 50%. My grandmother used to say, the devil find work. Come and finish it with me. So I had the hands. The third is this notion called technology. And if I had time, I'll give you an example of how in energy, 20 years ago, international oil companies like our own used to own 80% of the proven world reserves. National oil companies only 20%. Today, that has reversed. International oil companies own only 20. National oil companies own 80%. Because they've figured it out. It's our oil. It's in Saudi Arabia. 72% of the proven world reserves are under that. We pump 11 million barrels a day, every day. By this morning's price, it's $108 per barrel. In three lifetimes, Saudi Arabia will never be poor. So they come and hire people like us to work for their national oil company to continue to add value. We need to innovate and we use technology. So we go to places where they can't go. The days of easy oil, where you scratch the sand, boom, this thing flowed for 50 to 100 years are gone. That oil we find in the Arctic is cold, it's dark, nothing works. And we can only go down by technology. We go for things like hydraulic fracturing in shale gas that has revolutionized. Uh, North America brought down the total price of energy to about $4 per metric ton. And that molecule of gas in the Karoo, the fifth largest gas reserve in the world, at 485 trillion cubic feet, left on its own. In 30 years, that molecule would have moved only that much. So you need to help it to stimulate it to come to the surface so that you can use it for, amongst others, electricity generation using combined cycle gas turbines. You can use it to make petrol using gas to liquid technology. Sasol, perfect at CTM. You can use it for CNG, compressed natural gas, where you can power entire fleets, buses and trucks between here and Cape Town with the size of a fire extinguisher. Gas, and when it runs out, it switches automatically to this. You could produce chemicals, and you call that GTC, gas to chemical. And of course, you can pack entire communities. Like uh, I think it's called a goli gas. A goli gas, where you and my friend uh, is the CEO. Um, and the only town that I know that has recently been built is Waterfall Estate, um, that is totally ready and packed. And the fourth um, is probably this notion that we call the shifting power from the west to the east. If you haven't realized, then you've missed the point. All of us went to. Western medical schools, we read med Western uh, 
literature, uh, but I think the 1st of January 2008 demonstrated beyond initial doubt when the US of A um, started this global research, initially precipitated by mortgage sub prime crisis that then led into a liquidity crisis and a full blown global recession, which then affected Europe, mostly Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And that time, exactly that time, China was sitting on for 3.047 trillion US dollars in cash. Most companies, icon American companies today, are owned by Chinese people. So it's not very long that uh, this cozy arrangement between the US of A that they always choose the managing director of the World Bank and the EU where they always choose the CEO of the International Monetary Fund is about to come to an abrupt stop because he that pays the piper come and finish it because the truth so very soon when China says you know we have decided that in 2014 we will choose the CEO of the IMF it's very unlikely that anybody will say no because they have the means. This is the country that in 2010 were on to their 12th five year strategy. At 60 years, driving only two things personal security and energy security. If you compare it with our 20 years of democracy, I can tell you of at least six economic plans that we have produced. Starting with the RTP and then GEAR, something called as GISA. Today we've got two economic plans one driven by Ibrahim Patel, the other one by. Uh, Minister Trevor Manu, and we hope that the National Development Plan uh, will, will prevail. The last one is this notion called financial depression, where governments, the whole world, not just our own, are looking for more rent from fewer people. So there's about 11 million of us who are gainfully employed. Only 5 million of us contribute more than 80% of the 987 billion revenue that Minister Praveen got and got this year. And then there's 15 million of us who are on some sort of social security. So the math doesn't add up. How to far support 15 if we don't put very <coughs> specific interventions, strategic <coughs> plans in place today, we're going to cry tomorrow and it will creep on us like we didn't know. So I really thank you for this opportunity to allow me to burst into your, your conversation this morning, and I'm hoping that you learn as much as I would, because when one state invests the midnight oil, one gains access to the demon of knowledge and wisdom. The world of me, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. Have a wonderful morning. Goodbye. <laughs>